And according to the Bible, this is the, this is a false message. It, it, it is it is not something that the Bible teaches about the way to to reach heaven or to attain salvation or to gain entrance into heaven by God Himself. The Bible actually declares that we're saved by grace through faith. And so Abraham, the Bible says, was credited because of his faith. He believed in a promise that God had given him about what would become of him and his offspring, the generations that came after him, but ultimately it pointed to one offspring. And so because Abraham believed this, not knowing exactly who that offspring was, God still counted it as faith. And so Abraham pleased God, and he was declared righteous by God because of his faith, not because of works that he did. So he says this, he says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. So we know the law. God gave his law. He gave us the Ten Commandments. The law speaks about things like lying and, and lusting and, and blasphemy and covetousness, dishonoring the Lord, setting up things that, that we put before God as, as our objects of worship. It's the law of God. The Bible says that he's written the works of the law on our hearts and our consciences bear witness to the work that he's written on our hearts so that when we do right or we do wrong, we instinctively know that these things are, are right or wrong. We know that it's wrong to steal. We know that it's wrong to lie. We do these things, but even still, we know that it's wrong to do them because the work of the law is written on our hearts. So we know the difference between right and wrong. Also, you know, when we do good things, we feel that we've done something that is profitable in some way or is commendable in some way. We, we like to be recognized for that. We like to be noticed for that. And so we know when we do right. You know, we feel a sense of accomplishment. We do things that benefit or help other people in some way. So we have a sense, an innate sense of right or wrong. And that, that sense that we have, that knowledge, is called the conscience. The conscience is with knowledge. It's a, it's a word that means... It's a word that means with knowledge. Con means with. Science means knowledge. And so we have the knowledge of right or wrong. The man who flees over here, who runs from the police right now, has a conscience because he did something that he knows was a violation of the law. And so he runs because the law is chasing him. And so the conscience testifies. The conscience testifies when we do right or wrong. That man, whatever he did, if he did not know in his conscience that it was wrong, he would have stood on his ground and not fled from the law. But he flees because he has a conscience and he knows right and wrong. So Paul writes, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. And so that's a question that we all must ask ourselves. The Bible says that cursed is everyone who does not abide by the, by the law that's written and, and do the things that's written in them. Okay, more specifically, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And so we have a problem. We, our problem is that there's a law that God has handed down and we, by our very nature, are lawbreakers. We have broken God's law regularly, intentionally, repetitively. Ever since we knew how to choose right and wrong, we are lawbreakers in God's sight. And to say otherwise is actually to call God a liar because He tells us in His Word that there, there is none who have not sinned. There's none who are good. No, not one. There's none who are righteous. There's none who seek after God. And so we have an idea in our minds of who God is and, and how to, to you know, somehow reach Him through our works and our deeds and things like that. But the reality is, is that apart from God intervening in the life of a person, and part, a part of God reaching into, into your heart and taking that heart of stone and turning it into a heart of flesh, what the Bible says, so where your affections towards God change and to where you understand who the God of the Bible is and you have a proper fear and understanding and reverence for this God, we will never seek Him on our own. We will never go out of our way to pursue God in such a way that honors the God of the Bible. What we do is, is what we're trying to please is a God that we fashion 
in our own minds. It's a God that we shape in our own imagination. It's a God that, you know, we say, well, my, my God would never do this. My God would never send people to hell. Or my God would never, you know, judge me for coming out here and, you know, getting, getting drunk every once in a while or sleeping around or speaking the way that I do. You know, my God would never punish me for that. And you're right. You, your God would not do that because your God doesn't exist. The God that would never do that is, is a figment of your imagination. And that's one of the oldest sins in the Bible. It's idolatry. You've set up a God that suits you. He's actually a God that serves you, not a God that you serve. And so the Bible says that's idolatry because you have created a God. You've fashioned Him in your mind. A God who pleases you and does whatever you want instead of you doing whatever He wants. So the Bible says that whoever does not do all the things that are written in the book of the law, which is God's law, we're cursed. We're under a curse. We're under a judgment because of that. And so every single person that's on this earth, every single person that's on this earth, whether they can hear my voice or they're on the other side of this great planet that we live on, has sinned against God. That's the, that's the reality of it. We were born with a sin nature and iniquity. Did, did, our, did our mothers conceive us? And so uh, our parents before us have sinned against God. We've sinned against God. Their parents have sinned against God. And I know it's not taboo, you know, and, and fashionable to say it today, friends. But the reality is, is that you and I, we are all sinners. That's what we are. The, the things that take place outwardly, the things that manifest themselves in this world, things like murder and thievery, things like abortion, things like rape and incest and diseases and famine and all these other things, they have, they, they, this is an outward manifestation of a root issue. The root issue is sin. The Bible says that the soul that sins will die. And that's why people die. That's why you're going to die, because you've sinned against God. That's why everyone dies, because we've sinned against God. And your cursing against Him doesn't change that. De denying Him with your lips and pretending that He's not real just because you impress your friends with a few little, like, paltry curse words against the preacher doesn't change your standing before God. In fact, it makes it worse. You're actually keeping up more wrath from yourself against God when you come and you oppose His Word. Because you're hearing about this gospel, this good news of life. You're hearing about what God has done to reconcile people to Himself through the work and the shedding of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, and His resurrection from the dead. And you take that word, you take that beautiful word that you hear, that good news of forgiveness and salvation, and you, and you trample on it. And you continue to crucify the Son of God over and over and over again by denying that God sent His Son to be the mediator between God and man. So repent, young lady. Stop, being, stop letting your conscience do this to you and repent. Why don't you flee from the things you're doing tonight? God is ruining your night, not me. God is ruining it. God is ruining your night. And the Word of God testifies that what you're doing is contrary to the will of God and the Word of God by those very words that you speak. Every time I come out here, she says, you ruin my night. Then repent. Repent. Stop sinning against God. And then you won't feel like your night's being ruined because you won't come out here to gratify the desires of your flesh. You'll come out here to glorify God with the things that you do. So we're under a curse because we sinned against God. And we've broken God's law. And then Paul says, now it is evident that no one, that no one is justified before God by the law. You see, the, the deeds that you do, if, you're, if your plan to get to heaven is by your deeds that you do, the Bible says that no one is justified before God by trying to keep the law. No one. You see, the problem is this, friends, even if you were able tonight, from this very moment forward, if you were able for the rest of the life that you have on this earth to never sin again, if you were somehow able to stop sinning and honor God your entire rest of your life, there is still an unpaid sin debt that needs to be reconciled. And just telling God that you're sorry for the things you've done without the debt being paid is a futile attempt to bribe God with our kind words. You know, it's, 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 it really is akin to a person who, who rapes someone and you know, he gets away with it for a number of years and then he finally gets caught 
and he goes before the judge and says to the judge, you know, yes, I, you know, judge, I, I did do that, you know, that crime the number of years ago, but here's the thing, I haven't done it since. So, I'm, you know, I've been a good guy, right? And the judge may commend the person for, you know, not continuing to be a rapist for the past five years, but the rape that he committed, justice still needs to be satisfied against that crime. And so much in the same way, justice must be satisfied by God for the crimes that we have committed against no, him. That's not real. No, brother, that's his problem. Like, uh, it's not real. Appreciate your input. Yeah, I would love to know. Like, uh, it's not helpful for anyone. And so our deeds, our deeds do not justify us before God by keeping the law. The righteous, the Bible says, shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. You see, not by works of the law is man justified before God. Not by our deeds. We can't heap up enough deeds. We can't heap up enough bags of works to bring before God when we die and stand before Him and think that somehow that is going to appease His wrath and His anger against us for the sins that we've committed against Him. By the works of the law, the Bible says, shall no flesh be justified in His sight. The righteous shall live by faith. So to be clear, to be declared right in God's eyes is not an act, is not a bit of a work that we do, but it's faith. To be declared righteous in God's sight is to, is to live by faith and believing that what God said about the Messiah, what God said about His Redeemer, what God said about the one who would mediate between God and man was Jesus Christ, and we believe that promise, we receive that promise, and we live according to that promise, and thus we live by faith. And so the righteous shall live by faith, not by works. The righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Keeping the law, trying to say, you know, well, I, I don't cuss, and I don't do this, and I don't smoke, or I don't drink, or I don't have sex outside of marriage, I don't, you know, fill in the blank, is, is not the means that by which God is going to judge you when you stand before Him. He's going to judge you based on perfection. And if there's a blemish on your record, and there is a blemish bigger than just a blemish on all of our records, we will be found guilty with no means to declare ourselves clean in God's sight. So the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. So if you've never broken a single commandment in your entire life, and if you believe that you can live your entire life without ever breaking the law of God, well, that's one way to get to heaven. But again, to presume that you have done that is actually to call God a liar because God says that nobody has done that, nor is anybody capable of doing that. So that's all there is to it. We can't. To say that you've never broken God's law is a lie in and of itself. Because they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, and Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the greatest commandment that Jesus said there is. And so, you could say, well, I've never done this, 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 this. If you have failed to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength every minute of every day of your life, then you're just like the rest of us. We're guilty. We're guilty. So the Bible says that if you think that you can be saved by the law, then you must keep the whole law. Never, ever, ever, once, ever, and never will ever break the law of God. But it says that Christ, though, Christ, Jesus Christ, redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. You see, the law the Bible says, was not made to save us. The law of God was given to show us that we need a Savior. That, that's the reality of God's law. We look at it, and the law of God is a, is a picture of the, the, the character and the nature of God. It shows us who God is in truth. So when you look at the commandments, when you look at the law, it's, it, it's, a, it's a mirror, and the mirror shines back on you, it reflects back on you, and it shows us who we are in truth, but it also shows us the character and the nature of God. So when God tells us in His law that we shall not lie, God tells us that because He's not a liar. And we were created to bear His image on this earth. And as His image bearers, if we go around like a bunch of little liars, deceiving people, then what we do is we distort 
the image that God created us in, and we dis we bring disrepute, we, we bring uh, a disparaging remark against the name of God and the character of God. So if a person is created in the image of God, which we are, and we go around committing sins that are contrary to the law of God, then, then what we're saying is, this is who our God is. You know, this is what we're putting on display to the world. That God is a liar and a thief and a coveter and idolater and all these other things. But in fact, He's not. And that's what we will stand before God, and that's how we will be judged. Our judgment before God is not going to be a horizontal judgment. You're not going to be judged by God based on how good you were compared to your friends, or how good you were compared to your enemies. The judgment of God is not going to be, you know, a horizontal thing, where if you sort of perch over someone else and say, well, you know, I lived a better life than that person, that that wins favor with God in some way. That cheapens the gospel. That cheapens who Jesus Christ is. Because, you know, when we talk about uh, whether we're good or not, you know, what we fail to do is we actually, very often, we ask, consider whether we're, whether we're good people or not. What we always do is we always compare ourselves to who we deem to be worse than us. We never compare ourselves to someone who we deem to be better than us. We always compare ourselves to people worse than us. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to people and asked them if they think they're good, and they'll say, well, you know, it's not, I wasn't like Hitler or anything. Well, I guess not. I mean, unless you killed more than six million Jews in a Holocaust, I guess not. But why do we always compare ourselves to people who seemingly have done worse than us, and we never compare ourselves to people who have seemingly done better than us? And so certainly if we're not willing to do that, even from a human perspective, how much less likely are we, are we willing to compare ourselves to a perfect, holy, just, righteous God? We don't. And yet that's the standard, and yet that's the standard that God will judge us by, by His law, by His Ten Commandments. That's how He looks at us, by perfection, by His perfect truth. And so the Bible says this, see that, that's the bad news, right? The Bible says that there's, there's nothing we can do to reconcile ourselves to God by our works. We are under a curse, the Bible says, because we violated the law of God. We have no redemption in of ourselves. The Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. By nature, we're children of wrath, is what the Bible says. And so, we have no means on our own to bring life to our God. We have the appearance of life. We look like we're alive, but we're really a bunch of dead bones. And, and we can do nothing to raise ourselves up. We can do nothing to, to resurrect ourselves. We can do nothing to gain entrance into heaven on our own. And so we need a work of God. We need God's intervention. We need God to reach in and do something that you and I are incapable of doing in, our, in ourselves. And that is to bring life where there is no life. To bring spiritual life where there is no spiritual life. So the same way, the same way, friends, that when, when a corpse is laying there, there's no, you can't go to a cemetery and walk around there and start speaking words and it brings people out of those graves. It's impossible. And the same goes spiritually. There's no way that a person who is dead in their sins, the way the Bible says, can do anything in and of themselves. We can do nothing to raise ourselves out of our spiritual death that we're in. So we need a work of God to do that. We need God to intervene. And so because we're under this curse, because we're under God's curse because of our sins against Him, which is horribly, horribly bad news and frightening news, we're told this then. Christ, Jesus Christ, redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. See, through faith. So God does, in Jesus Christ, what you and I are incapable of doing of our own. He sends salvation through His Son. Jesus comes to this earth. He walks among the very people who would betray Him and, and sentence Him to death. He lives the life that you and I could never live. He dies the death that you and I deserve to die. He pays a sin debt that you and I could never pay for. A trillion times a trillion times a trillion years over and then beyond infinity, Christ pays a debt that you and I could never pay for. What we cannot do. Christ, Christ, the Bible says, became a curse for us. 
so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. That's why I said in the beginning, when Abraham believed by faith, he was believing in something that had not yet come. God promised that he would, he would, he would make his offspring more numerous than the sand of the sea, but he would also bless his offspring. And so, through the line of Abraham, ultimately came Jesus Christ. All right. And so Abraham believed by faith that God was going to do what He promised to do generations and thousands of years after Abraham was alive. And today, we look back 2,000 years to the time that Jesus Christ came to this earth in fulfillment of all the Scriptures. He did everything that the Scriptures predicted that He would do and prophesied that He would do. And that He would come, and that He would live, and He would die, and He would be risen again. And by His rising from the dead, by virtue of the empty tomb, that Christ was laid in, it showed that God accepted the sacrifice that Jesus made for the sins of His people. Everything that Paul has written up to this point regarding the nature of salvation was to make a, dis a, a distinguished mark and a distinctness between being saved by works or believing that you could get to heaven by works versus what God offers through His Word and through Jesus Christ and that is salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ, His Son. So everything that He has written builds up this to show that what Abraham believed, he believed by faith. The law did not come until 430 years after Abraham lived. So he wasn't doing something, trying to keep some sort of law that God had handed down and then God credited him with, with righteousness because he believed some and did some sort of work. What Abraham did afterwards was a, was a work based on the faith that he had. And the faith... Praise be. Praise be. The faith that he had is what God credited as his righteousness. So leading up to this whole thing, leading up to this very moment in time, Paul now says and has, has explained that a person is not justified by keeping the works of the law. The person is not justified by, by believing that if you die doing more good deeds in your life than bad, that somehow you will be reconciled to God and God will let you in. The book of Isaiah tells us that our, our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. It's basically an attempt to, to, to live this life however we want, believing that somehow when we die and stand before God, we're going to present Him with a, with a paltry bag of works and somehow bribe Him into heaven. All the while that we spend an entire life ridiculing and mocking the name of His Holy Son. And God will not be bribed. God will not be mocked. God will not be ridiculed. God has made it very clear that the way of salvation is through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone. Not by our works, not by our deeds, not by our charity. These are commendable things, but if all they do is cause you to pat yourself on the back and you fail to give glory to the God who gave you life, and you do that as a means to proclaim the gospel of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who you are providing these things to, then you are doing them in vain. You are doing them to do nothing more than to heap up praise for yourself. And it robs God of His glory. It robs Jesus Christ of the power of the cross, the saving power of that shed blood to reconcile people to Himself through the blood that He shed to cover those who have believed by faith the same way that Abraham believed. Today we believe by this same faith that all that God promised was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so the shed blood of Christ is what we cover ourselves in. The work, the saving work of Jesus Christ is what our hope and our faith is in. And so what we do now, we do not as a means to earn favor with God. Not as a means to gain salvation, but because we have salvation. Because those of us who believe in Christ are saved, then the works flow out of the fact that we're saved. The works are the evidence that we're saved. Not a means for salvation. 
So the promise, now Paul writes, everything that God has, has been pointing towards, everything through the Old Testament, all the things that were spoken of in the law, and in the prophets, and in Moses, and the Psalms, Jesus said, did you not know that all of these things must be fulfilled in me, in Him? All the promises of the Old Covenant find their yes and their amen in the shed blood in the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. And so God then declares when the fullness of time, when the fullness of time had come, at the right time, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, friends, what this implies is that without Jesus Christ, we are not God's children. You know, this is a common thing that, that I hear so often, especially among young people, that we're all God's children. Hey, we were all created by God. But in our rebellious state, by nature, we're not all God's children. Apart from Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we're children of wrath. We're not children of the promise, we're children of wrath. And so, what Paul is saying here is that to those who have faith in Jesus Christ, we receive adoption as sons. Okay, female, that's for you too, as daughters of God. Sons and daughters of God. So that means that the only way that you are adopted into the family of God, the only way that you are credited with the righteousness of Jesus Christ is through Christ alone, and then we receive this adoption as sons. Before that, we are not God's sons or daughters. Before that, we are enemies of God. Before that, we are the only father we have is the devil. That's the only father we have, is the devil. And the devil testifies to the works. When you, when you, not only these people do things that mock God, but those who approve of these things, God hates. And so the declaration that God has made is that for those who by faith trust in Christ, and Christ alone, are adopted as God's children. So, so, you know, obviously by, by, by the ridicule and the scoffing and the remarks and the perverted acts that these children put on, it is clear that many are not sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. We say every single time we come out here that the gospel is good news. That's what it means. And I, I've never seen a single thing more ridiculed and hated than the message about your soul being reconciled to God. I, I, I've never seen something more hated than people being told that they could be put in a right relationship with God and be reconciled to Him and have favor with God and actually be called a son or a daughter of the King and such hatred come from it. And it only testifies to one thing, and that the Bible says that we hate God by nature. We hate Him. Otherwise, why would we treat Him this way? You would only treat someone the way that you treat the preaching of the Word of God that way as if you hated that person. You wouldn't, you wouldn't pour such contempt on them. But we... We, like everyone else, have gone astray. And so God says this, those who are redeemed, those of us under the law who are redeemed by Christ become adopted as sons and daughters of God. And if we are sons and we are daughters, then God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we're no longer a slave, but a son or a daughter and if a son and a daughter, then an heir through God. You know, we, we are so removed from even understanding the, the, important of, the importance of words anymore and, what, and the meaning of them, that we don't even stop and think that when God promises that we become heirs, heirs, co-heirs with Christ of everything that God is, is going to pour out for those who believe, it, it just like flips right by us. We don't even know what the word heir means. H-E-I-R, heir. Heir to the King. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Every blessing, every honor, every joy, 
every crown, every satisfaction, we become co-heirs with Jesus Christ for these things. Why? Because in the book of Revelation, they cry out, who's worthy? Who's worthy to open the scroll? And the Lamb came. The Lamb, who had the appearance of one being slain, came. And He walked right up to that throne. And He took the scroll out of the hand of God. And all of a sudden, the angels, all the angels in festal gathering who were there, and all who were around the throne worshiping God, all of a sudden the Bible says, they sang a new song. A new song. And the praise that had eternally existed to the Father was now being directed to the Son. Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain but conquered sin and death by His shed blood and the perfect life that He lived. Who is this Christ? Who is this Christ? A man, a pastor who lived some years ago he preached a sermon in um, Los Angeles in the year 1976. And the words that he uttered out of this sermon still ring true today for many in the church. Uh, it's played over and over. Many have listened to the sermon many times. I don't know if this was the entire sermon, but at, if at, at very least, this is an excerpt of it. And I believe, I believe with everything that I know, that this man poured out every ounce of energy and love for his Savior and his desire to see his God glorified, that he penned these words. Who is this that I've been speaking about? Who is this King that we've been speaking about to you? Who is this King of glory that offers salvation to those who believe? He is Jesus. This is what the sermon says, the man wrote. He says, my king was born king. The Bible says that he is a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. That's an ethnic king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. That's the king that we come to speak of tonight. That is my king. He goes on to say, I wonder if you know him. I wonder if you know him. Do you know him? Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim his handiwork. My king is the only one of whom there are no means of measure that can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of the shore of his supplies. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally grateful, graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's the son of God. He's the sinner savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He's honest. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He is the grandest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the supreme problem in higher criticism. He is the fundamental doctrine of historic theology. He's the carnal necessity of spiritual religion. That's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He is the only one able to supply all our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He's the almighty God who guides and keeps all his people. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. That is my king. Do you know him? Do you know him? 
O my King is a King of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislatures. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. That is our king. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He says, I wish I could describe him to you. But he's indescribable. That's my king. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. And he's irresistible. I'm coming to tell you this, that the heavens of heavens can't contain him, let alone some man explain him. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out that they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree about him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's our king. He's always been, and he always will be. I'm talking about the fact that he had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There's nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. That's our king. That is our king, Jesus. His is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. And all the power belongs to my king. We're around here talking about black power, and white power, and green power. But in the end, all that matters is God's power. Yours is the power. Yes, and yours is the glory. We try to get prestige and honor and glory for ourselves, but the glory is all His. Yes, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? Forever and ever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all the evers, then amen. Then amen. That is our King. That is the King of glory that we speak about. I'll close with these words so that you understand what the message of, of the Gospel is with regards to how you receive this truth, how you receive this message, this, this salvation, this offer of forgiveness, how you be go from, becoming, from being a child of the devil to becoming a child of God, a child of the King, a child of promise. This is how it goes. When does the building of the Spirit really begin to appear in the man's heart? It begins so far as we judge when he first pours out his heart to God in prayer. If you desire salvation and want to know what to do, I advise you to go this very day to the Lord Jesus Christ in the first private place you can find and earnestly and heartily entreat Him in prayer to save your soul. Tell Him that you have heard that He receives sinners and has said, He that comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Tell Him that you are a poor, vile sinner and that you come to Him on the faith of His own salvation. Tell Him that you put yourself wholly and entirely in His hands, that you feel vile and helpless and hopeless in yourself, and that except He saves you, you have no hope of being saved at all. Beseech Him to deliver you from the guilt the power and the consequences of sin. Beg Him to pardon you and wash you in His own blood. Beg Him to give you a new heart and plant the Holy Spirit in your soul. Beg Him to give you grace and faith and will and power to be His disciple and servant from this day forever.